Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Meet the Professor. As today we talk about the management of ER positive and triple negative breast cancer with Dr. Sarah Hurwitz from the uh, David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA in Los Angeles. We have uh, great faculty for this series, and later on we'll show you the results of a survey of the faculty of their usual treatment practices. As in all of our webinars, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to see discussed, just type them into the chat room. We'll talk about as many of these as we have time. We're putting out a very quick uh, one-minute survey at the beginning of this program, and at the end, if you take it, you'll get a lot more out of the program. We'll learn a little bit more about you. We do no webinars all the time now. Coming back tomorrow night, same time, same place. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, papers over the past year in immunotherapy and other non-targeted approach to uh, lung cancer. We'll see what Dr. Wakely and Pazaris think about adjuvant and neoadjuvant IOs and many other controversial topics. Uh, we also are doing a year in review program on colorectal cancer. Uh, we'll be doing that on the April 19th. We're also heading out for our annual uh, visit with the ONS uh, Oncology Nursing Society. We're actually doing 10 symposia there in about two weeks in uh, San Antonio uh, for the nurses here and those that you know. Uh, please, uh, if you're in the San Antonio area, stop on by. You're going to ONS or check it out online. We're going to be covering a lot of things. We've got uh, 40 faculty we're bringing to San Antonio. The next day, we'll be at the uh, AUA meeting also in uh, Chicago, we are doing two symposia there on the following day after ONS, one on bladder cancer, so much going on there, and then prostate cancer that night, Sunday, uh, April the 30th. We know a lot of people end up listening to our webinars, you know, while they're driving or working out. Uh, if you're into audio programs, check out our Oncology Today podcast series, including a recent program with Drs. Mayer and O'Regan on ER positive disease. But today we're here to talk about HER2 negative of breast cancer, so triple negative and uh, ER positive. As always, we have a bunch of uh, docs in practice who are eager to uh, get some feedback on cases. We actually have 12 cases. I don't know if we're going to get through all of them. This is the last one of these in this series, so we'll see if we can. We're going to start out uh, just before we get started with the cases and talk about the topic of ADCs, antibody drug conjugates in breast cancer. Then we'll get into the cases, and we'll also show you the results uh, of the survey we did of the faculty. Here are the cases, a bunch of interesting scenarios that we're just going to get Sarah's top-line input on. But I want to just start out with the whole idea of antibody drug conjugates. And you did this great paper uh, in Nature Cancer uh, looking at uh, antibody drug conjugates in general uh, in cancer. And, you know, so many, I feel like we talk about it almost every day. There are two approved in bladder cancer. Both of them are used often sequentially. First-line therapy for Hodgkin's for a while now has had an antibody drug conjugate, bevodotin. Diffuse large B cell, looks like maybe polituzumab is going to come in first line. Cervical cancer, tisodomab, bevodotin, endometrial cancer, mervituximab. So, Sarah, a lot of action going on in terms of ADCs. Any comments on this strategies? And do you kind of generally view at least the ADCs that we're doing now as sort of a form of chemotherapy? Yeah, actually, it's it's really amazing to see how far we've come when you consider that 23 years ago with Mylotarg, we were um, greatly disappointed when, when that drug ended up having so much off-target toxicity that the FDA withdrew its approval. And my, how far we have come now with um, these third or fourth generation ADCs. But I do think that um, some of the ADCs that have made the biggest splash recently are somewhat like chemotherapy. They're getting the chemo into the zone of the tumor um, and exerting its e effects, but it's not this original idea where the chemo is confined to the tumor, sort of the way that trastuzumab and tansine was. TDXD has a lot of off-target effects, which is leading to enhanced efficacy, actually, as does sasituzumab govotecan. So I think it would be um, wrong to say that these are entirely targeted to the tumor. So, yeah, there are a couple of sort of unexpected things that came out of TDXD. 
One, of course, was the Destiny Breast 03 study. I don't know that I've seen another study that showed one ADC is better than the other, and in this case, a lot better. So we're talking about TDXD versus TDM1, a drug that we were all excited about, and now we see TDXD blowing it out of the water. Any thoughts about what it is, at least in this situation, that you're getting greater efficacy? Is it the payload? Is it the target? What do you think is going on here, Sarah? Yeah, I think probably it's multifactorial. I think the the payload that's being used is a payload that is unique. Most patients are not treated with topoisomerase 1 inhibitors, uh, whereas patients with breast cancer are commonly treated with microtubule poisons, which is the payload of TDM1. Moreover, TDM1 is the benefits are highly dependent on high levels of HER2 antigen expression on the cells, whereas with TDXD, you don't need as high an expression of HER2. So if you have a slightly lower expression of HER2 on the cell surface, the drug is still able to exert its effects due to its uh, off-target or bystander effects owing to the membrane permeability of the cytotoxic payload. And the, uh, the other, again, sort of macro lesson that we learned about these agents was you know, the HER2 low paper you know, really groundbreaking. You did the uh, editorial in the New England Journal. Again, this is paradigm shattering. Here are a couple comments you made in the editorial. The implications of the results of Destiny Breast 04 are difficult to overstate. These will undoubtedly translate into a new therapeutic option for nearly half of patients with a diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer, an extraordinary finding. And these results should inspire scientists to begin the rigorous at clinically important translation. But you do a lot of papers, incidentally. I was going, your CV is incredible, <laughs> including efforts to accurately identify. You have like a publishing house there. These patients are most likely to benefit. We have a case of HER2 low uh, that we're going to present to you, a patient who got TDXD. But anything you want to say about your thoughts when you first saw the data and you were trying to put this uh, editorial together? Yeah, when you're writing an editorial, you, of course, want to be um, think about it critically and take the devil's advocate point of view. Um, it's hard with that study. That that was very challenging because the data were incredibly impressive. I mean, it, it received a standing ovation when it was first presented at ASCO. It, it, it deserved a standing ovation. Um, but there are some things that we need to consider and sort through relating to how to best identify patients who are most likely to respond. And I, I'm not convinced that the immunohistochemical assay is the best, the most sensitive way for us to identify patients who should be treated with this drug. Um, we also have to look at things like ILD rates and how can we mitigate that side effect and how can we mitigate the side effect of cardiomyopathy because remember in HER2 negative breast cancer, anthracyclines are used commonly now in the curative setting. That's not the case in HER2 positive breast cancer. And so the slightly higher rate of cardiac events in this trial may have been related to pretreatment with anthracyclines at a higher rate in the patients who went on this study. That's yet to be reported, but I'm interested in looking at that. Yeah, that was a surprising part of your editorial. You had a whole bunch of stuff on cardiac effects that I wasn't even aware of. Really uh, interesting. So incidentally, I can't resist uh, quickly thrown by a case that just came into the chat rooms from Smitha, because anytime it starts out 86-year-old, I like it. So locally advanced ER, PR positive, HER2 low, progressed on an AI, now progressing on, on fulvestrin and palbo, T4N2, and I guess the I guess she still has localized disease. I guess the question is, would you ever consider TDXD? We had two cases. I think you were in San Antonio for one of them uh, that we present of ninety year olds who got uh, dose reduced TDXD and responded with metastatic disease. Any thoughts about this case that Smitha has? Yeah, she also says, what about Taxol? Taxol RT? She says also. Question mark. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Uh, 
I think age is uh, relative to comorbidities and health. So there are 90-year-old patients who can tolerate chemo just fine, but of course you have to be careful and keep in mind um, the safety of, of the regimen you choose. If you're treating this patient as a metastatic patient, I think I would follow the label and first start something like capecitabine. If, if this patient is felt to be um, going to benefit from TDXD, which is like a chemotherapy, um, then, you know, I, I would first start a chemotherapy. That is how it's FDA approved. And I would use capecitabine. You could add radiation therapy if the local disease is, um, you know, not, uh, not going well and the patient needs to be palliated, palliated with radiation. Um, and if the patient's disease progresses on capecitabine, then yes, at that point, since you're treating as an unresectable locally advanced breast cancer, TDXD would be appropriate. So a couple other points about ADCs in general in terms of just sort of how we see these agents moving forward. We are seeing data, for example, this paper we have up here from Cancer Discovery and many others on ADCs uh, working in the brain. So it's another sort of concept, but also new agents coming along. And I'm curious what your thoughts are about DATO DXD, same payload as trastuzumab DXD or TDXD. But it looks like pretty interesting uh, data coming out with ER positive breast cancer uh, in terms of response and, and tolerability. Any thoughts about this agent and other new ADCs coming into the uh, breast cancer space? Yeah, I agree. These data are quite intriguing. Um, this is targeting trope 2, similar to the drug sasituzumab, but it has the DXD component. Um, I agree the data are very interesting in triple negative uh, breast cancer as well as hormone receptor positive breast cancer. So there are a number of phase 3 studies in the planning phase or an early startup um, looking at this agent. Um, the toxicity profile is a little little bit different from TDXD, more um, mucositis has been reported. I actually had a patient enrolled on the triple negative component of the Tropion study who had disease progress on uh, sasituzumab in the ASCENT trial, then hopped onto this trial and actually derived clinical benefit for some time with this, which sort of challenged my notion going into this that patients who were on one ADC with a similar payload wouldn't respond to another one that there would be cross resistance due to the mechanism of action of the payload, but I was wrong. So I think we're going to really have to, to see what the data shows in terms of whether we can sequence these agents. Yeah, like I was saying there with the bladder cancer, the sasituzumab and fortimab, and incidentally, and fortimab just got approved with Pembro first line in bladder cancer. So now another ADC uh, has moved uh, up. So, uh, yeah, there was uh, another question I saw. Oh, yeah. Hassan has a patient with left meningeal disease with HER2 low, progressed on ribo, cape cytomine. Wants to know, do we have any? I was talking about brain mets. What about men uh, left meningeal disease and HER2 low, TDXD, uh, Sarah? Not enough data, um, but I do want to underscore what you said earlier about the fact that we are seeing activity of ADCs in the central nervous system, which is challenging our paradigm thinking that bulky molecules can't cross the blood-brain barrier. We're seeing, you know, patients have real responses. The tuxedo study showed a 75% response rate in about 15 patients with progressive HER2 positive CNS METs. So if the patient has LM disease and, and local therapies have been exhausted, you know, a, a trial of intrathecal chemo has not uh, benefited the patient and there are, uh, there's extra cranial disease that needs to be treated and their disease is HER2 low, I wouldn't hesitate to try TDXD. So it's always a temptation. I could spend the next hour just going through the chat room, but I'm going to hold off and we'll try to stick with the cases we presented. But we're going to try to include some of these ones that are coming in the chat room as we uh, go along. But let's dive into uh, some of these cases. I mentioned we've got about uh, 12 of them, but we're going to start out with a premenopausal patient who has a small tumor, 0.8 centimeters, but two positive sentinel nodes. And the surgeon ordered an oncotype, much to the oncologist's dismay, because she would have wanted to give chemo. 
And it's, uh, as always, of course, and now it's low, so you don't know what to do. Here's Dr. Gupta. 48-year-old premenopausal woman who has grade one, about eight millimeters invasive, but two out of two sentinel lymph node positive. Recurrence score of nine. Don't know what to do. So I think those are the patients that are very confusing. I said in my view that I would not do the oncotype in this patient and offered chemotherapy, but it was already done, the oncotype. But I was thinking I would try to give ovarian suppression and then AI. One of my colleagues was arguing that he would have done the oncotype because, you know, that nine would still make the decision not to give chemotherapy, while I and another one of my colleagues were saying that we would not do the oncotype and just offer them chemo. So she actually got TC followed by by LHRH plus AI. Any thoughts about this case and her questions? Yeah, I think at least once a month we see a similar case like this come through our multi-tumor board. And I have to tell you, I agree, this is so challenging. We have the data from our expander telling us it doesn't matter what your recurrence score is. If, if, if you're premenopausal and you have one to three positive nodes, chemo will benefit you. But it just biologically doesn't make a lot of sense. And the problem is that our expander study didn't give ovarian suppression to patients. We really can't know how what the interaction is there. The challenge for me, because I would try to avoid chemo here, but the challenge for me is that there are patients who try ovarian suppression and cannot tolerate it. So if you're relying on ovarian suppression to replace chemotherapy, it may not be a safe bet um, because patients need to do that for five years. So I think a really intense discussion with the patient about what this means is important because we don't have good data one way or another. The other issue that really even goes beyond chemo or not is you do an axillary node dissection to look at more nodes because now we have issues, you know, for example, CDK in the adjuvant setting. If you have more nodes, more likely to use it. And yet there was an editorial in the JCO, Sarah Tulaney and colleagues bringing this issue up, saying they're still not going to do node dissection just to get number of nodes. Here we have a patient with two sentinel nodes. Any thought about that issue? Yeah, it's it's almost like the KI-67 issue where you're forcing pathologists to do KI-67 to meet the criteria to give adjuvant abemacyclib. And luckily, with the update from Monarchy at San Antonio, the FDA has altered its guidelines in ter- or its, its approval of abemacyclib. I, I agree. I think it's going to be patient-by-patient patient situation. I don't think that it is right for a patient to be sent back to the OR to do additional uh, dissection, given the mor- morbidity of that and the unlikelihood that the dissection itself is going to impact their outcome. If they have high-risk features, I would be inclined to offer a bemacyclib. The other side of that, though, is insurance approval um, issues. And so I I, I think these are very individualized cases that are going to require us to be strong advocates uh, for our patients. So oncologists are always presenting cases to me of premenopausal women. You know, there's a lot of questions about how to manage them in terms of, particularly as it relates to uh, oncotype. And here's another case, a 42-year-old premenopausal patient of Dr. Leisure presents with a big tumor. Here's his questions. It turns out she's probably going to have her surgery first. But I guess two questions. One is, if she really does have a tumor that's more than five centimeters, does she automatically need chemotherapy? Do we trust oncotype in tumors more than five centimeters? I think the other thing is, knowing that this tumor is large, I'm really thinking about ovarian suppression and aromatase inhibitor for her, not tamoxifen. But with the abemacyclib data out now, if we decided we were going to treat her neoadjuvantly, would you give her a bemacyclib along with a variant suppression and aromatase inhibitor as opposed to just an AI, or is there a role for fulvestrin? Yeah. <laughs> Any thoughts? So simple. It gets Amelia, harder as so you go <laughs> along. Oh, we're in trouble. It's like the boards. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
So do we trust Oncotype in greater than five centimeters? Um, not a huge number of patients. I, I think we have to, I had to have to look at the subgroup analysis from Taylor X and other studies. I mean, I'm inclined to do surgery first here to get the nodal status um, and the true size of the tumor rather than neoadjuvant, unless I have a surgeon say, look, we can't do surgery now with, there's no way we can get clear margins, even with mastectomy, then our hands force. But with a grade one ERPR positive tumor, it's unlikely to get much of a response regardless of what we give. Um, we did give neoadjuvant, abema, and endocrine therapy on the neomonarch study. The path CR rate was low, as it always is with any systemic therapy prior to surgery in this type of tumor. So I, I would do oncotype if it was a node negative um, five centimeter tumor in a 42 year old. I think it would be informative. If node positive, I think given the size and node positivity and the age of the patient, I'd be inclined to uh, to skip Oncotype and recommend chemo. So uh, I want to show some results from the survey we did of the faculty. This is actually the third one of these webinars uh, that we've done on this topic. And each one, I'm starting to get a stronger and stronger feeling about whether or not uh, endocrine therapy in premenopausal women in the adjuvant setting how it's being applied. We were talking in the last program, there was a big pay of updated so soft and text. Kathy Miller, who I think did the last one of these, uh, or one of these, uh, was the, uh, did an editorial on that. And I don't see in that editorial, I don't see in the guidelines something that we found in terms of the question of, do you give tamoxifen by, when do you use tamoxifen alone as adjuvant therapy in premenopausal woman? And the reverse side is when are you going to use ovarian suppression and ablation? And well, before I show you the data, let me just ask you, would you agree that in general, the relative risk reduction when you use ovarian suppression ablation plus either tamoxifen or uh, AI is going to be greater than tamoxifen alone? And the reason you don't use it in everybody is as you get lower risk and the absolute benefit of tamoxifen or endocrine therapy decreases, now you have to encounter more quality of life issues, maybe even specific complications. So just from a risk benefit point of view, um, it maybe is not worth doing. Is that principle you think the way we're th thinking about it? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so... so so here's what we found, which is, I mean, when, if you think about tamoxifen as endocrine therapy by itself, I think you're talking about node negative for sure. I mean, node positive, they're going to get chemo most likely, and they're even uh, and ovarian suppression plus something else. But what we saw in node negative when we asked the faculty is whether or not they used tamoxifen alone was heavily affected by recurrence score, as it makes sense. And in general, what we're starting to see is when investigators are going to use chemo, and a lot of that has to do with recurrent score, they're going to use ovarian suppression and ablation. I don't see that in the guidelines. And that's just like what you all are doing. But And maybe it's not scientifically perfectly perfect evidence, but there it is. You change, we say, recurrent score eight, and you see a number of people bring it up to mox. And some, Kathy, for example, are still saying AI, because you are going to get a little bit greater effect, but then you bump it up to 20 and every nobody's saying tamoxifen. And uh, so any thoughts about that, um, you know, and, and positive node also, uh, you see not only the issue of chemotherapy, regardless of recurrent score, but again, a lot of use of ovarian suppression and ablation. Any thoughts about this? And are we under utilizing ovarian suppression? Yeah, I think what you're seeing is the gut response um, based on sort of summarizing the data in one's brain when we um, are lacking solid evidence to guide us. And I do think we are heavily influenced by the recurrent score when we're weighing whether or not to use ovarian suppression in our patients going on endocrine therapy. I know I am in practice. If I have a low recurrence score and a node negative tumor, I'm going to be very comfortable with tamoxifen. But once we get a node involved, that's additional information that, that impacts our use of ovarian suppression. And if we have a higher oncotype uh, recurrence score, that, that's certainly going to influence in clinical practice. It doesn't appear in the guidelines because we don't have level one evidence. We don't have yet, and there will be data in the future telling us how to sort out 
benefit from chemo versus benefit from ovarian suppression, um, and you know whether endocrine therapy alone without ovarian suppression is is sufficient in certain patients based on recurrence score. So we're kind of all using it at this point, assuming we know what the answer is. Often we're right, sometimes we're wrong, which is why we need to do the studies ultimately. So, uh, yeah, that's our way of doing consensus is uh, if everybody says the same thing, we call it a consensus. If they don't, <laughs> then it's not. But just to finish out, there's so much attention been on archetype and premenopausal, just to kind of make sure we know where we're at in postmenopausal. So we say here, a patient who's 65 with one positive node, low recurrence score, nobody's given chemo. And uh, even recurrence score 20, nobody's given chemo. We say three positive nodes, same thing. So that's, that's that to me, that was the main, even though everybody's talking about premenopausal, that was the most important thing about our expander. That's where most of the patients are. Any comments? Yeah, I think it's really cool to see that people are, at least um, in this group of people polled, applying the data from our expander and not utilizing chemo um, in our uh, women who are postmenopausal with up to three nodes. I saw a patient this week, however, of a grade one invasive lobular tumor with seven positive nodes. It was only a 1.8 centimeter tumor, but they were shocked when they went to surgery. It was seven positive nodes but it was grade one invasive lobular. We know that, oh, and the recurrence score was 10. So can we then extrapolate to more than three positive nodes in this woman who is in her 60s? This is where, again, we enter a data-free zone. And I think I, you know, I and the other oncologist you saw her were tempted to use all that information, including the recurrence score, to lean away from the use of chemotherapy. I was just thinking about this way of doing sort of consensus. And you look at this slide and you go, well, what's, your perf what's the best AI to use? This is a perfect <laughs> example of a coin flip. <laughs> just ask me, half the people say one, half say the other. What about the issue of using ovarian suppression for fertility preservation? We did a whole program with uh, uh, Kathy and uh, Ann Partridge about premenopausal patients. The other thing they brought up was not just fertility preservation, but preserving ovarian function so you don't have premenopausal uh, issues. Uh, so when we say uh, ER positive, HER2 negative, most of the faculty are you, will use this uh, during chemotherapy to prefer both uh, for fertility as well as ovarian. When we say HER2 positive, kind of similar answers. Uh, and I think that, well, we think we had triple negative. Oh, no, I, I guess I skipped the triple negative, but anyhow, same thing. Any comments about your current use uh, of LHRH during chemotherapy for these two purposes? Yeah, so for ovarian function preservation, I think, to be honest, when I read it, I was reading it as ovarian function um, suppression, um, because I will see this as both preserving fertility, but also getting a head start on the OFS needed when we add in endocrine therapy later. Um, and then if they're young enough and are going to complete their endocrine therapy and, and be able to have, have children, then, you know, this, this, it likely improves fertility preservation. Um, so I wasn't thinking about, uh, I, I guess the fertility preservation and ovarian function preservation are somewhat synonymous to me. I know they lead to different endpoints, but I think I was re reading it more of OFS. Right. And any comments about this other, you know, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time because we've already talked a lot about the issue of choice of CDK inhibitors, as long as we're talking about hormonal therapy in the metastatic setting. We have seen a sh uh, the beginnings of a shift towards RIBO because of the uh, survival data. Here you see uh, some of that, not 100%. You're one of the RIBO people, I guess, just go with the data? I, that's where I am. I mean, Palbo's whole history began at UCLA. So it's uh, we've done studies with all of them. I think Palbo may be the best tolerated, to be honest, in my experience. Abema probably the least tolerated. Um, and Ribo has hit that sweet spot of hitting overall survival 
uh, endpoint uh, in at least three randomized clinical trials now. I think that's really compelling, whereas, you know, Palbo has not. So that's, that's the underlying reason for my answers. So we're going to talk about oral SIRS, and now we have one allocentrant uh, that's approved in patients with ESR1 mutated uh, breast cancer. We asked the faculty, of course, everybody's uh, on board, but has different ways they think this through. How are you uh, thinking through the use of this agent, and what situations are you using it now? Um, I'm using it after the CDK4-6 inhibitor and endocrine therapy, and I also feel that dual targeted therapy, meaning endocrine therapy plus a PI3 kinase pathway inhibitor likely benefits patients more than single agent endocrine therapy. So I would position this in the third line setting in a patient having an ESR1 mutation. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of times nowadays we're talking about press releases. We learn about trials before we actually see the data. This one just came out from the Natalie trial, a second phase three study showing benefit in the adjuvant setting of a CDK inhibitor, in this case, ribociclib. Hopefully, maybe we'll see this at ASCO. Hopefully, we'll see it soon. Of course, we need to see the data any thoughts about uh, how this is going to affect practice? We're already seeing a lot of Abema being used. Is this, do you think this is going to end up being sort of a, again, sort of coin flip, hard to figure out what to use? Well, we need to see the data, but any thoughts about where this is going to lead? There are a couple of things that distinguish this study. First of all, the RIBO is given for three years, whereas with Abema, it was two years. It's a lower dose of RIBO than we're using in the metastatic setting, which will hopefully mitigate that QTC issue and, and reduce the need for us to follow EKGs. And also, this study included a medium risk population of patients, so it's not just for high risk patients. Um, and then finally, I think RIBO on a day to day basis is a bit better tolerated than Abema. So it may be that we have two choices and, and we have to sort through the side effect profile, concomitant medications, and relative benefits of these two agents when we decide. So getting so many great questions and comments in the chat room. Dr. Kumar has a patient who had nine positive, no ZR positive, been on an AI for 10 years, uh, now actually 15 years. We have a case, if we get to it, if a patient's been on it for 16 years, keep it going. He wants to know. <laughs> oh, that's such an important question that we just don't know. I mean, I suppose what we do in these situations when we have a ton of lymph nodes involved is is we're considering these patients to already have stage four disease and we're keeping it below the level of clinical detection with the use of prolonged therapy. And, and I have done this in a few patients with a ton of nodes involved. I think, again, it's, it's looking at the risk benefit analysis. How are the patient's bones holding up? How are the side effects? What does their cardiac profile look like? Lipids, et cetera. Um, we don't have data beyond 10 years at this point, so we're sort of off the reservation doing this, but on some patients, I think it's, it's a reasonable approach. So one more chat room, I can't resist it, from Danny wants to know, would you combine l with a CDK inhibitor in the second line setting? I would not combine any of the investigational oral SIRDs or l which is now approved outside of a clinical trial. Uh, there may be interactions that affect the, the level of either of the drugs in the blood and may affect uh, the safety. So I would be very cautious about doing something like that. And although we're all tempted to do it, I would um, strongly advise against it. So before we get into another case, uh, this is a fantastic paper you and your colleague, Dr. Zhang, did on Oncotype in premenopausal women, but actually it's a fantastic review article in general on Oncotype. I mean, there's a long, lot of stuff in there, really great. Incidentally, you have this paper, I love this thing, the history of Oncotype. Over there on the left under 2004, quick story, we were at the San Antonio meeting in 2004. I was doing an interview with Dan Hayes, and he says, you need to go find this pathologist with the NSABP name Soon Paik and do an interview with him. So I found him, interviewed him, and of course, he told me the story of what he was about to present. 
Amazing. When you think back at that point, anybody with a tumor over one centimeter was getting adjuvant chemo. So what yes. an amazing impact this has had. Or And I love these graphics. I'm not even going to get into this, your algorithm, just to ask people to please take a look at the paper. It's an awesome paper. We also put in the slide deck a bunch of papers about ongoing trials, looking at oral serves that you might want to check out. Uh, here, one uh, that actually is no longer going to be available, amsinestrant, uh, because of the lack of uh, benefit that was seen. Uh, again, there's some great uh, graphics in these papers about how these drugs work. We're not going to go into all the details. What about uh, camizestrin? And in general, what's the difference between the oral surds? Is it going to be a kind of me too situation, whoever has the data? Uh, we saw, you know, some pretty interesting data from this Serena 2 trial at uh, San Antonio. Yeah, the Serena 2 study, I think, was, um, you know, a, a mood lifter for a lot of us because we had just come off seeing or hearing about negative data relating to amsinestrin. And uh, people began to worry is, is you know, all of the hype around oral surds um, overdone. Um, and then Serena was presented and it was a nice positive study, shows really what appears to be reasonable safety. Um, and so we have the second oral surd that, that it does appear to be effective. And of course, we um, have a number of ongoing studies looking at um, alternative agents that target estrogen receptor in ER positive tumors. So I think it's an exciting time. We don't have any head-to-head -head comparisons among these various agents. Um, so we're having to do sort of in the back of our mind a cross-trial comparison um, among these agents, which isn't fair. Um, a lot of them will cause some nausea. Some cause bradycardia. Um, we have to watch for drug-drug interactions, so we have to be careful about that. And I think as you analyze these studies, it's, it's important not to compare the efficacy of one versus the other since trials have different enrollment criteria. Some studies are allowing more heavily pretreated patients. Um, some are really focusing in on ESR1 mutated tumors. So those sorts of nuances can affect what the efficacy looks like. And I, I would just advise everybody to look at these drugs individually based on the studies that are presented rather than comparing um, one to the other until an actual comparison is done. I was just flashing on the fact that uh, it wasn't that long ago that when we were doing HER2 programs, we were going, it's a shame there's not as much to talk about in ER positive breast cancer. Now, like we're still haven't even got through it. I mean, we could spend two hours just on ER positive, which is such a great development because that's where the patients are. And speaking of that, of course, I've got to ask you about capivacertib. Boom, we saw a phase uh, three trial that uh, followed this initial phase two study, uh, the Capitella 291 study presented at San Antonio. Any thoughts about this agent? Uh, would you like to have it available now? And in what situations would you be using it? Yeah, it's a very exciting AKT inhibitor, um, and uh, we saw some very exciting data relating to it from the faction study. Um, these phase three data, of course, um, provided um, more uh, validation of those data um, and uh, demonstrated that patients who had up to two prior lines of endocrine therapy for advanced disease, up to one prior chemo, um, and uh, about half or more of the patients had had a prior CDK4-6 inhibitor, um, patients benefited in terms of a strong benefit uh, with respect to uh, progression-free survival, a trend toward improved overall survival. And in my op opinion, again, it's not fair. I just told everyone not to do cross-trial comparisons, but I was intrigued that the safety profile seems to look better than it did for alpalesib. Um, although there was diarrhea and rash and hyperglycemia, the severity was much lower than we've seen with other trials of PI3 kinase inhibitors. Um, and the benefits of this drug were seen regardless of whether the tumor had PI3 kinase pathway activation via PIK3CA mutation or AKT mutation. So yeah, you, this could be a drug that can be utilized the way that we utilize Everol in all patients with ER positive breast cancer. So, and I guess it's being looked at uh, in the first line setting, uh, or at least then it's uh, combined with fulvestrin and palbo. We'll see how that goes in terms of tolerability, seems like. I mean, fulvestrin and palbo is certainly well tolerated. So, you 
would imagine this. We'll see what efficacy. All right, let's uh, talk a little bit more about HER2 low. Uh, Dr. Chen has a 70-year-old lady who's currently getting TDXD. She's not sure what to do now and what to do next because some of the lesions are responding and some are progressing. Here's Dr. Chen. This is a very nice 70-year-old woman. Clinically, she's doing okay. She does have a mild pluriffusion, and she has the bony metastasis, and she also has cutaneous metastasis. So she has wounds, which she's cared for by wound clinic. Her most recent PET-CT does show a mixed response with it, improving some of the sites and progressing other sites. Since she's tolerating this well, we're continuing her on the Fabtrustuzumab, but certainly the question is, what will be the next treatment for her? Since she had shortness of breath because she has the mediastinal adenopathy and she has been, you know, on and off oxygen in the past. I would be interested to know in terms of the follow-up for patients on famitrastuzumab in terms of how frequently to image to look for interstitial lung disease or what other workup we should do for interstitial lung disease. And I was mentioning the ONS Congress that we're going to. We're actually doing a program. As a matter of fact, your colleague Zev Weinberg and GI is going to be there. We're doing a program on HER2 across tumor types. So we have GI, lung, and breast. We're going to try to talk about them all together. And of course, the lung people, you know, were HER2 mutant, but uh, the lung people have a lot of patients with pre existing pulmonary pr- problems. This patient has a pulmonary symptomatology from the cancer which, you know, it's interesting how you approach trying to pick up ILD in a patient like that. Any thoughts about this case? What you might be thinking about next is the patient clearly does have progression. Uh, Why you think you might see a mixed response? You think it might have something to do with HER2 expression? Any thoughts? Yeah, so in terms of monitoring for the ILD, um, we don't think that the presence of pulmonary metastases uh, causes an increase or elevates the risk of ILD, but it, as you mentioned, it can make it more difficult to discern is ILD occurring. I, in my practice, um, tend to follow the scans every nine weeks or so, the chest CT. Um, sometimes you'll have a patient who's responded so beautifully you're tempted to start doing Q3 to four month CTs to follow the disease, but with the lung, I do CT scans. Um, I've We could even do a low-dose CT of the chest just to keep an eye on the lungs because ILD can occur even after a year of being on therapy, so it's important. Um, In terms of uh, progression, I think there's a lot of work being done now to identify uh, pathways of resistance, and it may come down to loss of expression of the target antigen, but there could uh, also be other mechanisms. And for this particular patient, I, I can't recall if the patient had hormone receptor co-expression, but we do have sasituzumab govotecan as an available agent now for hormone receptor positive um, breast cancer based on Tropics 2. Um, that might be something to be considered, although the payloads are, are fairly similar. And again, sequencing these agents one after the other and the efficacy of doing that is not entirely understood at this point. And actually, Kamal in the chat room brings up the possibility of sasituzumab in a patient like this with HER2 low disease. Been a big debate ever since the HER2 low data came out about, I guess, hormone receptor negative, you know, HER2 low, formerly triple negative. What comes first, sasituzumab or TDXD? Any general thoughts about that? It's a huge area of controversy, and and the way I sort of address this is the two different the side effect profiles essentially. Um, some of my patients are will do uh, as much as they can to avoid full alopecia. Uh, sasituzumab has full alopecia; TDXD does not. Some patients are very worried about the risk of ILD. Sasituzumab doesn't have that as much. Uh, Sasituzumab has more diarrhea and TDXD has more nausea. I think the data for both agents is quite are quite compelling, um, and we don't have a head-to-head comparison of them. Um, however, one needs to keep in mind that the ASCENT study was a trial that enrolled all patients had triple negative disease, whereas in Destiny Breast 03, only about 10% of the patients had hormone receptor negative disease. So we don't have the same level of evidence supporting TDXD here. Um, all that said, 
TDXD did perform beautifully in the patients with triple negative breast cancer in Destiny Breast 03. So I think it's a reasonable option to consider. So I like to brag we have the best chat room in the business. Uh, here's another quick one from Fadi. What comes first, CAPI or Elicestrin in ER, ESR? I assume you could get CAPI in ESR1 mutant patients. <laughs> Um, all these questions that are so tough to answer. In my opinion, if CAPI is available, FDA approved, I would use it first. Again, I think the PFS we see uh, with dual targeting, meaning targeting PI3 kinase pathway and the hormone pathway together, gets you longer PFS than doing single agent endocrine therapy. So I would sequence it that way. So maybe we'll come back to some more of the chat room in a second, but let's keep going because I want to bring in another topic, PARP inhibitors. So Dr. Lamar has a 48-year-old woman. This is, a, you know, Hal Bursting always says, I make up these scenarios and they never happen. Anyhow, she's got a patient <laughs> with, uh, who's got a BRCA mutation and triple negative disease who's getting Keynote 522. Here are her questions. 48-year-old who was diagnosed with multicentric right-sided triple negative breast cancer. I treated her per Keynote 522 with pembrolizumab, carboplatin, and paclitaxel, followed by AC. During the course of treatment, she was found to be BRCA1 positive. With neoadjuvant treatment, she achieved a complete response. In patients who have received treatment per Keynote 522, in the adjuvant setting, do you continue pembrolizumab, particularly for those patients who have achieved a complete response? Now, my patient did not have residual disease, but in a patient with residual disease who was also BRCA positive, how do you approach these patients? Any thoughts? Great questions. I definitely continue the pembrolizumab in the patients, uh, regardless of whether they've achieved a path CR, because the keynote study was designed that way, and there's still a trend toward a better outcome with the use of pembrolizumab um, in those patients who do have a path CR. We don't have studies showing that you can have the same benefit by omitting the maintenance pembrolizumab. The only place where I've not done that is if I have a significant adverse event, uh, immune-related adverse event. If the patient had residual disease, um, I feel fairly comfortable, again, outside of um, you know, standard practice or guidelines, but I would feel comfortable utilizing a laparib um, uh, as per the Olympiad study um, in uh, patients and use it with the pembrolizumab. I think, um, you know, the, the combination should be relatively safe and, and I would feel comfortable doing that. So another PARP question, uh, hey, PAL B2, you know, we talk about it. Well, here it is, 50-year-old premenopausal patient of Dr. Mitchell. Here's the case. Not only did she have bilateral disease, she had bilateral no positive disease with extensive involvement, but she had no endosomatic disease. So she was treated with adjuvant chemotherapy because of the number of lymph nodes she had. I think she had over four on one side and I think over six on the other. It was pretty impressive. She had like T3 and one. T2 and 2. The other issue is how does PALB2 play into this? Because oliparib does have activity for PALB2 germline mutation disease as well, is my understanding. We know that platinums have a lot of activity. And you know, I would love to ask where do we start with this lady? Where do you would you start? Yeah, so it's ERPR positive and with the PALB2 mutation, I, I don't, he didn't say uh, whether or not, um, it, so it's bilateral cancer with bilateral positive nodes. So I, I think the patient does deserve chemotherapy. We don't always do that in ER positive, but with positive nodes in her age, I would certainly do that. And I would utilize a platinum-based regimen here. Um, I would definitely feel comfortable utilizing a laparib. Patients with PALB2 mutations weren't allowed in the Olympia study, but it is something that um, I think given the way that PALB2 mutations work, so similarly to BRCA1 and 2, I would feel comfortable doing that to improve her outcomes. So any comments about how uh, the Olympia has been playing out in your practice and also how uh, elaborate is tolerated in your experience in the adjuvant setting? 
Of course, you have the issue of GI issues and also cytopenias. What have you seen? Um, so the GI issues, in my opinion, are the most bothersome to patients, notably uh, nausea. So patients need to have antiemetics uh, available at home and need to, um, you know, sometimes I've had to dose reduce actually uh, therapy to help them. These are patients who have universally already had chemo and they're fairly tired of the side effects from systemic therapy. So I've had to do a lot more hand holding in the adjuvant setting uh, with patients going on a lap rib. So uh, here are a couple of questions we asked the faculty in our survey somatic BRCA. In general, people view that the same as germline, same thing that we've uh, heard from the uh, GYN people. Germline, PALB2, most people haven't seen it. That's why I was so excited to present this case, this patient actually had. But again, most people consider it in the same uh, manner as the others. Um, I'm just going to skip th through these. What, are, what about in metastatic disease in terms of choice of agent? We have two there. You say either one, other people favor a lap rib, maybe because they have more experience with it. Any differentiating factors between the two, hair loss? Um, I haven't seen differences in hair loss. I've seen um, more anemia with telazoparib, um, maybe a little bit more nausea with laparib. There hasn't been a head-to-head -head comparison, and I think you hit it spot on. People are comfortable with what they've worked with, and given the availability of a laparib in the curative setting, I think we have a whole bunch of people who, who are comfortable ut utilizing a laparib. Tala is only available in the metastatic setting. So Iki uh says, uh, would you use a PARP inhibitor in a patient who ran out of all other options but had a BRCA of variant of unknown significance? I wouldn't place a lot of faith uh, the benefits of, BRAC of PARP inhibition in patients with a VUS and BRCA, no. All right, let's do some rapid rounds here. We have a few other cases just to kind of get your top-line thoughts. 36-year-old woman uh, diagnosed uh, with breast cancer, 18 weeks uh, pregnant, Oncotype 17. Here's Dr. Astral. She came to me 18 weeks pregnant, grade 2, infiltrated ductal, two separate areas of cancer, 15 millimeters, 13 millimeters, ERPR positive, HER2 negative, KI67, 20%, Oncotype 17. She's 36. So there are a number of different issues here. First, she wants to continue the pregnancy. There's just no question. So then what do I do? You can't give a hormonal agent to a pregnant woman, whereas you can give chemotherapy. You just wait. How safe is that for the woman? I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm giving her four cycles of AC, which she started at week 20. I'm giving it to her every three weeks. So we really appreciate so much that docs will put their practice out there in front of us for people to take a look at. It's so helpful to hear real cases. A lot of times when the investigator goes, I don't know what to do either, it makes everybody feel better. But any thoughts about this? Yeah, I, I think that Dr. Astro has handled this perfectly. Um, we do have a good amount of safety uh, supporting the use of AC during pregnancy based on um, patients who are diagnosed with leukemia or lymphoma, which is life-threatening uh, during pregnancy. And it's pretty safe to give. And we have mounting data relating to the safety even of um, a paclitaxel. I agree with the Q3 weekly dose that he chose um, so that you don't have to use growth factors. And of course, you can't use endocrine therapy for this particular patient. I wouldn't have qualms about using chemo in spite of her oncotype score of 17, given this very unique situation in which she finds herself. So I know the audience, so a lot of our audiences use entrectinib, but I'm not sure you have. Anyhow, have <laughs> you incidentally? <laughs> okay, well, here it is. 49-year-old woman, ERP, ERP. And this is really the benefit of getting NGS, though. You know, you had another paper we didn't talk about where you looked at NGS and premenopausal women. I really recommend that one as well. Anyhow, 49-year-old patient of Dr. Gosain. Got a biopsy and sent it for NGS. She was picked 3 ca negative. So we started her on Everlimus and Fulvestrins. She further progressed 
And this time it was liver lesions that were rapidly progressing. Looking in her NGS, she also had NTREC mutation. With her recent progression on capecitabine, I've started her on NTREC inhibitor. It's been about two months. She also has three brain lesions. She got SBRT for all three of them. She's asymptomatic with her brain lesions. She's on NTREC inhibitor at this time. At what point do you consider NTREC inhibitor in someone like breast cancer? Is there data that this also crosses the blood-brain barrier? She's doing remarkably well right now. Where do the faculty members consider NTREC inhibitors for breast cancer when you have so many different multiple lines of treatment that you could play around with? And I think actually NTREC in, in lung cancer does have good CNS uh, penetration, better than crizotinib, or I think in ROS1. Any thoughts about this case? Yeah, I I would be so excited to find an NTREC fusion. <laughs> um, I have still not uh, encountered that in my clinical practice, and we do a lot of next-gen sequencing. I think I, I applaud his use of it um, after Everolimus fulvestrant. I think patients have a higher likelihood of benefiting from therapies used earlier line um, setting. Um, moreover, this is a targeted therapy for her particular disease. So why delay it for some chemotherapy that is less targeted to the biology of the particular tumor? So I think, you know, I wouldn't place it above a CDK4-6 inhibitor, but certainly before going to chemotherapy, if you've discovered it, I think think it's worthwhile to consider using it. So we just did a big endometrial cancer uh, program at the Society of Gynecologic Oncology meeting where they had two gigantic phase three trials looking at MSI high endometrial and MMS stable. Curious, have you seen MSI high breast cancer? I have not um, personally. I've, I've seen a patient who had a tumor mutation mutational burden that was relatively high and we used uh, pembrolizumab, but it was very, very late setting and didn't see a response. But um, again, it's something we evaluate for in all of these patients and it's, it's relatively uncommon to find. So yeah, there's some great stories that come out when you find it, as everybody in the audience knows. So here's another case. Actually, I see Dr. McKenna in the chat room. So uh, she's got, this is what I was talking about before. 63-year-old lady who presented in 2006. We were just talking about Oncotype was first presented in 2004, so she was one of the early beneficiaries. She actually had metaplastic breast cancer, which I don't know anything about, but an Oncotype of 51. Here's Dr. McKenna. 63-year-old, she was diagnosed in 2006 with metaplastic breast cancer that I knew Nothing about at that time. 1.2 centimeters, node negative, LVI positive, grade three. The ER was 20% and PR low. Oncotype value was 51, was off the chart. She underwent surgery and then six cycles of TAC, local radiation. An astrozol started in December 2006, had severe tendonitis. And strangely, switching her to letrozole worked. Because, you know, letrozole causes a greater reduction in estrogens than does an estrozole. So the questions I had was with her, she's been on an AI for 16 years. She's an engineer, as is her husband, and she's not had any side effects. And she's very afraid to stop her letrozole. So is it wrong on my part to continue the AI, and what is the natural history in this treated lady with metaplastic breast cancer? The other question was, with her low ER, am I fooling myself using an AI? And, you know, also high oncotype, I'm not sure how, does that reflect on, you know, endocrine responsiveness? Any uh, comments, and any comments about metaplastic Breast cancer, have you seen it? Oh, yeah. They tend to be more sarcoma-like, triple negative, more locally aggressive um, rather than distant metastases. 
Um, I think this patient, in my opinion, is likely cured if it was truly a metaplastic cancer, that low expression of ER, I think, and, and I think it was lack of PR probably drove up the Oncotype score. I would have probably used an AI similar to what she did just to cover my bases in case there was heterogeneity in the histology of the tumor. Um, I would probably get a second opinion pathologist at the time to confirm it's metaplastic and not a poorly differentiated. At IDC, but I don't really believe that there is additional benefit by being out 16 years and continuing it, other than maybe the benefit of reducing the risk of a new breast cancer and remaining breast tissue. But I, I, even beyond five years, we don't have good data to support that. So I think I would probably stop the anti-estrogen therapy. So another case in the chat room from Hassan, 30-year-old uh, pregnant uh, patient, 22 weeks, inflammatory cancer, large nodes, triple negative, question mark, approach the therapy. Can you use an IO during pregnancy? No, I would never, I would not use immune therapy during pregnancy. Um, this is somebody I would use anthracycline-based therapy and consider taxane depending. You know, hopefully you could do the anthracycline and get her to uh, a delivery and then give the taxane platinum and you can do immune therapy at that time after delivery. So Sarah, thank you so much uh, for working with us on this program. So exciting in breast cancer, so exciting in oncology in general. Really looking forward to seeing what's going to happen. Hopefully at ASCA, we'll see. Maybe we're going to have another CDK in, available in the adjuvant setting. Audience, thank you for attending. Call back tomorrow night. We'll see what Dr. Pazaris and Dr. Wakely have to say about immunotherapy of lung cancer, particularly in the early stage setting. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thanks. Take care.